what we're seeing right now is something that's unprecedented. We're seeing the, the growth in technology and the transformation and the evolution happening at such an exponential rate that back 10 years ago it was an 18 month cycle to two years. Now it's like six months. Um, and, and the growth rate is surpassing the business by about 10 to one right now. So technology is evolving much faster than we're able to keep up with, which is the reason why AI is being promoted so heavily and being brought in. And so one of the things that you'll see from me more and more is you'll see me talk about exponential IT, which is something that's been coined as a phrase from where I work at, which is a research and advisory firm that's driving a lot of that and a lot of the AI practice stuff that's going on today. So, but with that, Josh Aaron, CEO of Aiden Technologies, and here to talk about hyper automation. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, thanks. Very good. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> Yes. 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 Happy, happy to do it. Um, on that note, let me thank uh, Toby and Craig and the board of ABTP. I mean, I, I will say, when I thought about this organization, and Craig called me and asked me to do an event, and we are really busy growing a company. As he said, every six months things are changing, so we're working pretty hard at Aiden. Um, but this was an opportunity to give back to a community that shares the same values that I've had throughout my entire professional career. Um, and I know, Toby, you mentioned it used to be called the American Association of Business Machine, Association of Business Machine Operators. So I don't think I'm going to go that far back, but I do want to take us back for a second to 1988. Um, this may be what things will look like in the future, but <laughs> I'm going to take us back for a second to 1988. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a kid in high school in New York City. I'm 16 years old. And I'm doing really well in computers. I, when I was a freshman, I took a class with a senior and then worked directly with a teacher uh, in my next couple of years. And in the middle of my junior year, he says, you're doing so well, Josh, that I, I can't even help you anymore. I was just doing Turbo Pascal and some languages some of you may be old enough to remember. <laughs> um, and building like an airline reservation system to match like what they were doing with Sabre in the airline industry. And, and he's like, next year we're gonna get you into NYU for your first year during your senior year in high school to do some work there. And I go home that night excited to tell my parents about it. And my dad comes home and sits down and says, Josh, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay, and he looks really upset, worried. He's like, I, I don't know how to tell you this. You know that trip that we take to Sanibel Island, Florida every year on spring break? And we go there and you and your mom always look forward to it. We go down for a couple weeks. We're not going to be able to go this year. And that was because uh, I've just lost my job. And he was an advertising man in, in Madison Avenue, like the show Mad Men. And I said, Dad, you're so creative. You, know, you work with all these big brands and things. And I, it just seems like things were going so well. And he said, well, they're computerizing the whole office. Computerizing, <laughs> that was the word back then. And um, I don't know how to use the computer at all, and all the kids that we're hiring are using the computer to do all the drafting work and things like that, and they said I'm no longer relevant you know, to the organization. I can't work there anymore. And it was crushing for me, but for our family. Um, it was really, really kind of a crazy time in my life, but it was also inspirational. Um, it made me feel like I could help him, and I remember trying to help him and telling him I'll teach him the computer, he could get back to work. He was very resistant to learning, and that didn't work out so well, but I just always felt like I wanted to give back, and I wanted to use technology, and I have throughout my entire career to help people be happier in their careers, to be more successful, more productive, and that's why when I got wrapped into AI and hyperautomation, I saw this as the next wave. Um, now I'm gonna flip forward 30 years ahead, uh, in 2018, I get a new job to be the CTO of a private equity firm in the Bay Area. Uh, we are raising the, at the time, we didn't know it, but the second largest fund in private equity history, a uh, $16 billion fund. And I'm hired to do vendor due diligence, uh, but also to do due diligence with the investors that are looking to invest billions of dollars in our private equity firm and convince them that we have the IT, the security, all the things that we need to have in place to take their money and, and keep it protected. And, and their data and their privacy and everything else around it. Um, it's my second week on the job and we have an auditor from a, a company called Stroh's Friedberg. Some of you may have heard of them. They're not part of Aon Insurance. Uh, 
he walks in, his name is Nahir, he walks in, he sits down in my office and he says, Josh. And he looked like uh, like a balloon that just deflated in the Macy's Day Parade float and everybody's looking at him or something. He just looked totally deflated and he's like, I, I've been here a few weeks before you got here and I know you know what I'm doing, kind of, but we haven't really talked yet. I have something terrible to tell you and we really need to talk. And he shuts the door. And I was like, well, what, what is it, right? I had been hired to move the company to the top of Salesforce Tower, to get our investments done, to re revamp all of our tech and everything else. And he says, well, I know you've got that big project list. I saw it the other day. You're going to have to put all that stuff on hold. We just ran a tenable NESA scan, and you've got over 11,388 critical and high vulnerabilities. Plus, you have a whole bunch of other vulnerabilities. It's like over 60,000. I was like, 60,000? Um, how could we be in that position, right? You know, what? So I start digging in and looking into everything, and we were using a system to patch software and to take care of things. We were using uh, Avanti at the time, but it, it was then it was called Landesk. Now it's Avanti Patch. Um, it used to be Shavlik. They bought it. So it's a pretty old system I had used in 2011, um, but it, you know, could work if you had enough engineers to operate it, and. You know, I went and talked to my team, and they're like, we, we just can't keep up. It, it isn't that the software doesn't work. We just can't keep up. But we think that you should look at this new technology. Uh, we just saw it you know, a few weeks ago. Actually, my predecessor had signed like a tentative agreement to bring it in and pilot it. At the time, it was called Mass Deploy. And it was an automation, or what we now call hyper-automation, for deploying software in Microsoft Windows environments. And I was pretty nervous, to be honest, at the time. My engineers are like, you should go take a look at it. I'm like, well, why don't we look at SolarWinds, Kaseya, and so, something else that's tried and true that other organizations are using these days. They're like, just take a look at it. So I found out that it was being used by another major private equity firm, and I got our CFO to hook us up with the people in IT there. And they gave us a little taste of what it was like, and we went ahead and put a plan together, and we put it in place. And three and a half weeks later, I'm in my office again, and the guy walks in and with a smile on his face, and he sits down, and he's like, I have good news for you. I said, great. What's the good news here? He said, we just ran the Tenable Nessus scan again, and I have the report for you. We have under 300 total vulnerabilities in the environment. 97% effectiveness in less than a month. And that was in 2018. The technology was in its infancy compared to today, today, right? As Toby and Craig just mentioned, the technology is advancing so fast right now. I, I have a friend who's the CEO of a data center company here in the Dallas area. They're called DataBank. I just had a call with him about a week and a half ago. And his name's Raul, and we know each other back from New York, from Queens, actually. He's a Queens guy. And he said, I said, how's the business going, Raul? You know, you, it seems like you guys are doing great. He's like, this is the best year I've ever had in the data center business. And he's been in the data center business since I met him in 1997. I said, why? He said, because just like the internet days when it was 2000 and you know 90, late 90s into 2000 and we saw the internet boom and data centers rising and growing, we're back to that again. The drive to build AI and hyper automation and all the things we're going to talk about today is that aggressive. They're seeing the biggest spike in the data center industry since the late 90s. So without further ado, let's get into it. <laughs> uh, what I want to do today is, is, first of all, try and define it a little bit. Because I think that not everybody really has a clear vision of what hyper-automation means. It's a big word, buzzword. We all talk about it. And I also think it's really important to understand what's going on because of everything we just talked about, how fast it's changing, how much it's going to impact everyone's lives, particularly those of us that work in IT and IT security. Right? So I want to talk about the current state of IT and IT security, the challenges that we're frankly not meeting in many areas. I want to talk about the rise of this technology and some of the things that it's doing. And I also want to talk about challenges, opportunities, future trends, things that we can look at. And, and I want to talk about how we all as professionals can really embrace this technology. Um, the other thing is I want to make sure that this conversation is a little bit um, bi-directional, right? So please do not wait for the end of this conversation to ask me a question. You don't even have to raise your hand. 
just feel free to shout it out. Stop me in the middle of this talk and say, I, I, I want to say something. Okay, that's fine. And, and with that, I, I'm going to start with this one. Who here has a, their own definition of hyper-automation? Can someone tell me what they think? I, and just feel free to shout it out. Bring a system online quickly, efficiently with a small set of resources. Yes, that is the what we need to do with hyper automation. Doing it at scale. Doing it at scale. Yes, it's about scalability for sure. That's absolutely a big part of it. Secure and risk mitigation. Doing it securely and risk mitigation. We're definitely going to talk about that today. The key is being used is consistently. Yeah. Consistently, right? Having processes that happen the same way repeatedly, you can predict the outcome every time, right? Less custom scripting. Less custom scripting. I like that one. Yes, yes. We'd all like to do less, less I'm, scripting. I'm guessing yes. here, but you take, you use building blocks and you build a system out of functional blocks that you know work. And so you don't have to do any coding inside the block. You just need to pass it information and get it back. And you take these blocks that are specialized yes. and build something, and you don't have to do a lot of QA on the detail work because you know that's going to be a consistent output every time. Just a guess. I saw one more. Thank you. Building blocks. Yes. Automation of processes. Automation of processes. Yes. Okay. So sticking a, stick I, I a think sticking a, a knife in the Macy's balloon and mm -hmm. legacy systems, mm -hmm. getting rid of the sacred cow so that you can. Uh, make the investment to automate your entire system. A lot of times that's based on legacy systems. Sticking the knife in some legacy systems and being prepared to make an investment. Yes, that's all part of implementing hyper-automation. I, I, this is a little boring and dry, I realize it. So I'm just going to read you the textbook definition for a second of hyper-automation. We all have a lot of different ideas, though, and that's, that, that's what I wanted to point out. I think every audience that I've talked to about this topic, every time I talk about it in a sales call, everyone has a different definition of hyper-automation. The, 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 actually, ChatGPT told me that the textbook definition <laughs> of hyper-automation, hyper-automation refers to the advanced methodology of automating processes and workflows in an organization through the combined use of multiple technologies, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic process automation. I'm not sure we even know what that one means and other advanced tools. It extends beyond traditional automation, aiming to augment human capabilities and accelerate decision-making efficiency and flexibility in operations. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's a mouthful, right? That's a, that's a lot of information right there in that little definition. I, I have my own kind of way of recognizing hyper-automation is what I call it. And that is some of the things I've got up in the slide here. When you see more than one of these technologies that we're talking about being put together into a solution or a product, so AI, machine learning, robotic process automation, right? When you, when you see a bunch of these technologies doing, this, you know, doing actions on a process together, that's a big indicator to me. Um, process optimization. I was an industrial engineer in college at the University of Michigan. We worked on things like the Ford FT80E uh, transmission assembly line. And, and we would do stuff in those days, like look at a, a worker on an assembly line. I remember going and, and seeing there was this giant rack, and it was about as far away from the assembly line, which is sort of the second row here, as where that you know, easel is, right? And that rack had parts on it that weighed about 75 pounds to 100 pounds. And there was a union auto worker wearing suspenders who had to walk over and pick up the part and walk all the way over to the line and put it on, right? And, and I used to say, it's not, <laughs> industrial engineering isn't really about common sense, it's about uncommon sense. Because these guys have been working this way for years and we got there as a senior design project. And one day we're just like, why, why can't we take that rack of all those heavy parts and put it right next to the guy? So all he has to do is go like this to put it on the block. It's that kind of concept, but it's being done with the technology, with the coding that's driving the AI and all the machine learning that we're seeing today. Right? It's that same kind of concept. Advanced analytics. What do we mean by advanced analytics? 
really, really fast reporting, but predictive reporting. Things that are, it's able to look at such a wide swath of data so fast, faster than we could ever put eyes on glass, and come back with some insights about that data, right? And then digital workforce, and to me, this is like the biggie. Does it feel like a robot? Does it feel like, and this is the scary part too, does it feel like it's taking our, our, uh, the place of what a human used to do? If it, if it checks you know, three out of those boxes, four out of those boxes, four out of four, you know, then, then you're pretty squarely in the world of hyper-automation. Why are we doing this, right? We're doing it because, not to replace people's jobs, but because of the benefits that it's unleashing in our world. I, I, how many of you have dabbled with chat GPT? And I just see like, yeah, ev everybody in here, right? Yeah. You see this presentation. It looks pretty nice, right? It's not terrible. I did it myself in four hours using chat GPT and Dolly to create the graphics that are in here. No artist drew any, uh, well, the artist was the machine, <laughs> right? Um, you couldn't have done that before. I said to Laura, our head of marketing is here today, of our content marketing is here today. I said this would have taken us like four days. And I put it together for this talk in four hours. It's incredible the speed at which we're able to get things done with the support of this. But the AI is not up here giving you this talk. I'm up here giving you this talk. Because there's still something that the computers aren't going to be able to do. And that's be as relatable as we can be as humans. Right? We, we need that in our world. And that's, I don't think that's ever going to change. I want to talk about some, some use cases here. Right? <laughs> How are we actually implementing it? So AI and operations, IT operations. Right? This is a big one. And our own company, Aiden, it stands for AI for Desktops and Enterprise Networks. Our whole use case is around software deployment and building computers. We like to say the bot that we have, it ensures that every piece of software on that computer is going to be exactly what's supposed to be there, and there's not going to be anything there that shouldn't be there. The bot figures it out, and it doesn't care if it's looking at a computer for the first time that you just pulled out of the box, and you log in with your Microsoft username and password, and now there's these things called autopilot that kick off our bot and everything else, but it just builds it to what the company's policy says you should have. And it doesn't care if that machine's been sitting on a shelf for five years and you just pulled it down, it's got all the software on it. It's going to look at it the same lens. It's going to say, what's wrong with this computer and why isn't it in the state that we say it needs to be in today? As opposed to an engineer who may have all the, the, the knowledge, but they have to inspect everything on the machine and, and then sort of figure out, well, what do I need to update? Where do I get that software? The bot's able to do all that stuff faster than any IT person was ever able to do it before. We saw that back in 2018, and now we've built five years of technology on top of that, right? So it's, it's even better. Uh, you, has anybody in this room heard of ServiceNow? Okay, I, I'd be shocked if some of you de didn't. Um, in my day, the big help desk systems out there, who remembers Heat? Anybody remember Heat? <laughs> Yeah, a couple of people, or Remedy. Anybody remember Remedy? Yeah, I, I like to say they were like, um, it's like the difference between series and parallel, right? When you use those solutions, they could process one, you know, kind of help desk ticket at a time and go to somebody, they'd work on it, they'd add their notes, and go out, and then if they knew who to forward that help desk ticket to next, <laughs> they could go ahead and forward that ticket. And then the person would get it and you know, work on that piece of it, put their notes in, send it to the next person. That doesn't seem super efficient these days, does it? What ServiceNow is doing is with different modules for different departments and large organizations, they're able to route that same information to the people who need it right away through what they call AI Ops. They have a, they have a product now called AI Ops that sits between all their other products and get multiple people working on their parts of it at the same time, speeding up the approval process for things that need to get done, like buying new software, buying new machines, or anything like that in IT. Um, they're being used in, in so many new ways to automate processes, it's incredible. 
How many of you have heard of MoveWorks? Has anybody heard of the company MoveWorks? Okay. I encourage everybody in the room to go Google them and look them up a little bit. And there are other companies. Amelia is one. I think AI Sir, AR Sec, something like that is another one. These are, who's familiar with chatbots? Have any of you used a chatbot? Okay, what was your experience like, sir? Can I ask you, uh, what's your name? And tell us what your experience is like using a chatbot on a website. Yeah, I, I, I Kim Jones, and we used the, uh, the original IBM one to, uh, to uh, Watson, that's it. Watson, IBM Watson, yeah, that was an original chatbot, yeah, yeah, one of its features. Uh, I mean, it was just a, a labyrinth of logic that never made any logical sense. I mean, a a labyrinth of logic that never made any logical sense. I like that, that's great. <laughs> I have to remember that one. Um, and we just had it on a um, content center service application to kind of help the Did you do any CSAT surveys to see what your customers thought about? Like, how, how did people feel about the early chatbots? Uh, they were very limited and very frustrated. It's kind of like you know, people pick up the phone and call American Airlines, which is kind of tenable all the time. You know, uh, can I help you, agent, 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 representative? Yes. Anybody dealt with any of them on the website, where you get an agent? How, how do you like being engaged by the agent chatbot on the website? The, by the way, those are what we called Web 2.0, <laughs> right? So that, that wasn't that long ago. I think it was like five years ago. Um, also, MoveWorks, yeah, we got one more. I was going to say, I had an experience last week where I was talking with somebody. I'm assuming it was a live person. They said they were live. And they said, uh, please go and do this and click on this. And so I just typed in. I went and did that, and I typed in the word done. It's done. And immediately it came back with, thank you, would you like to take a survey now? So my, my chat ended with this supposed human being because I put in the word done. And how did it make you feel? I hate it. I hate it, right. Frustrating, right? Way, it's, does frustrated sum up the way that people feel when they get a chatbot, a traditional chatbot? Yeah. So what MoveWorks, Amelia, AI Cirque, uh, all these companies are really doing now they're working with conversational AI. And they're doing it in such a way that, yes, it's still a chatbot, but uh, who's heard of the Turing test? Right? The, the Turing test is all about AI and whether or not you can distinguish are you talking to an AI or not when you're having this conversation. Their goal is to get to the point where you don't even know that you're talking to the computer. And the way they're doing that is with machine learning examining all of the different tickets or speech patterns or whatever's going on in the organization regressively, looking backwards, and then matching the lingo in that industry. So how close are they to getting really to close? Be able to, to speak Spanglish. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> to speak Spanglish. You can, you can right. talk English and you can talk Spanish, but when you mix dialect or mix languages. Yes. They they can do it. Yeah. I've seen some examples of it. They can do some really, like she says, can you speak Spanglish? You know, people may talk and go back and forth in dialects between, and my wife is Taiwanese. She goes back and forth in Chinese, Mandarin, and English to our daughter all the time. If the AI sees that that's the normal pattern in a conversation, it can start to emulate that pattern. It's, it's really incredible. And, and like I said, if some of you haven't seen these, these solutions, I absolutely encourage you to go out and take a look. But the whole goal is to create this feeling that you're not talking to a machine. How do you wrap in the cultural differences? Like we speak English, Great Britain they speak English. Yes. We different. They have this framework of the royal family. We have this framework of Republicans, Democrats, whatever. <laughs> How do you detect those kinds of differences and wrap that into an intelligent chatbot? I, I'm not working, just to be clear, in a company like MoveWorks, but I can tell you from colleagues and friends that are, and, and just being on the side of evaluating it as part of some of the implementations we're working with as a partner, they are doing those things. They are looking at cultural differences, ethical differences, what, what's okay to say to someone in what language, or you know, all those kinds of things. And 
they're training it, um, just like any other large language model, they're training it in conversational AI techniques. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not, it's not in the traditional large language model that they're thinking about. It's actually looking at videos, it's looking at dialects, it's looking at generations of, yeah. of audio and video that's been produced, and using that to sit there and help models of that. And that's how the deep fakes are coming around, right? It's taking things like that from other stuff. But in an organization, it's looking at the history of that kind of interaction in systems that they had before. So maybe they had heat or remedy, right? Getting a bunch of help desk tickets for 20 years. They can feed all that data into the system and then run the machine learning against it to learn it. Yes. <laughs> yes. So what happens when there's a, a judgment, you know, with, with, or some type of level of authority where someone has to decide whether, say, you're you're calling in for a problem resolution, and it's not black or white. It's there's always that gray area, and if you're if you're the service provider or the solution provider. You get to a point where you have that authority to say, yes, you know, I'll grant whatever it is that you're asking. Mm -hmm. but that's, to me, that's a tough one because how do you... The AI is still routing those tickets to the correct approvers. It's just doing it so much faster. Yeah, right. And it's often in a process that there's multiple approvers. So what used to happen was that sequential thing, right? Like I'm going to use that example again of just buying a new piece of software for somebody Who's checking to see if we have a license available? But, but a Who's point negotiating? It's right. Sorry. It's, a case of point where it's not infallible, right? For example, it's definitely not infallible. Maybe, I don't. I don't want to make yeah, people think yeah, we're there, right? We're not. Yeah. Yeah. Working with a chatbot, right? That he actually manipulated so well that it accepted a zero dollar offer. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not infallible, and that's why you need risk and contingency models around the use of AI, but. The fact that it's not infallible doesn't mean we don't need to embrace it, because if we don't embrace it's happening whether we want whether we want to embrace it or not. We need to embrace it as IT leaders, right? So I read for a lot of business leaders that one of the biggest concerns is latency in getting decisions made out of the field, if you will. Yes. So the best way to address that is to push this information to the people in the field and put the decision making out of the field. So Ticket agent doesn't have to call HQ, doesn't have to call a manager, doesn't have to call anybody. They've got all the information at their disposal in the field at the point of transaction. I'm going to give you an example of doing this in the field okay. in just a minute <laughs> with one of these implementations. Um, I do want to switch and move us forward and talk a little bit about, we talked about how it's, that's an IT operational use. I want to talk about an IT security use, right? Because it's huge in security. Um, you know, in the first one, I mean, who? I talked about Aiden a little bit, that we're putting software on the machines, but I didn't talk about the fact that we're reducing the vulnerabilities so drastically since the story, right? Remember that story? We're now seeing we can go into a new industry and dramatically reduce the vulnerabilities, even though we don't have their software packaged, right, because we never worked in that industry. We can start packaging it faster than it was ever done before and get results faster than ever before. And I'm going to give an example of that in a little bit. So. It's dramatically not just making people happier and getting the software out there and making their computers run better, improving their digital employee experience, as they call it now, but it's also making them more secure. It's very much advanced in the cybersecurity posture. But it's not doing it alone, right? You hear about the topic of defense in depth and all the different technologies that we have to have these days. How many people are familiar with CrowdStrike? I would assume. OK. Uh, has anyone used it? OK, I see a couple, couple hands up. Oh. CrowdStrike is doing some really interesting things on threat detection. What, what used to happen was, I'm sure you've all heard of what signature-based detections are, where you would look for a certain pattern. But they're not doing that anymore. That's, that's, I mean, this isn't just CrowdStrike. It's CrowdStrike, Sentinel-1, other new vendors that are coming to the forefront. Um, Microsoft Defender is still largely signature-based and gets a lot of criticism for it. Um, however, When's the last time somebody saw or heard a lot about, you know, like McAfee <laughs> or Symantec antivirus, right? Those technologies are, are on the board, were on the board, you know, 20 years ago, they were the leaders, right? And, they're, and they've been leapfrogged by these companies that are leveraging AI and machine learning to do this work. CrowdStrike 
has the ability to look at a whole bunch of different what we call uh, vectors, right? Threat vectors, things that are coming into it. Do machine learning against all of them, correlate that information, and look for patterns that don't match typical patterns. So it doesn't have to know. No one has to tell it you always block this traffic at this port on this firewall or things like that, right? It studies the environment for a while and sees that that's the way things need to be. And then if it sees something happen that's different, it alerts people to it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's coming as bloatware, we call it, on your on your Costco purchase. Yeah. 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 Them for another year and, and get some additional services. So the question is, is like you said, that obviously the their technology of uh, last year or previous year turned into AI. Right? So how do you get to using something like like how do you get rid of faculty and then uh, one of the better ones you can describe? It's actually one of the, not to use another shameless plug. Is that one of the benefits of what we do at Aiden is clean up all of the things that come on your computer when you first buy it, or get rid of the bloatware. Right? And it's not just things like old, outdated antivirus that you may not want, like McAfee. It could be things like the Candy Crush game, which could be an attack vector that you just don't need on a business computer that you're using for work, or the Xbox tools, or things like that, right? They, they come on there anyway, because Microsoft wants them in there. We make sure that they're, make sure they're not in there if they're part of your standards. But, Yes. We don't have an Aiden for consumers, at least not yet. That's a, yes, not yet. <laughs> um, and there are some big challenges with doing this at the consumer level, and, and that's mostly because consumers don't even know what they want, right? So if you can't tell us what you want, how do we know what to put on the machine, right? But these are things we're thinking about. How would we do that? And then the last one I just want to mention is a company called ContraForce. I, I don't know how many, does anybody in the room heard of ContraForce at all? They're a local Dallas-based company. Uh, they have a product that is effectively, a, they used to call it an open XDR. Um, it, it's sort of like the next evolution of SEAM, Cybersecurity Incident Event Monitor, right? But now what it's doing is advanced AI correlation. So it's looking at things like Aiden, like Microsoft Tools, Defender, Sentinel, they really integrate well with them. But it can also take feeds from things like CrowdStrike and all kinds of ServiceNow, other systems. And then it's looking broadly across everything. Do we see a pattern of behavior that we should get eyes on glass right away? Because what's happening in, in network security operation centers all over is I don't care if you have an army of 100 people with eyes on glass looking at one of these products, a human can't look at I don't know how many of you have ever seen the research. We don't actually multitask. Computers do. They multi-thread and multitask, but humans don't. We think we do. We think we can like play the violin and, and do something else at the same time, but there's all kinds of research out there that we don't do that very well at all, <laughs> and we don't actually do that. We're, we're sequentially in our brains switching back and forth all the time. We're time slicing, and we're never doing as effective a job of, of, of what we're doing when we're time slicing. The computer doesn't have that same issue, right? So this is a way of looking across all these different systems at once and looking for patterns of behavior, again, that don't fit the norm. It may not be a big deal that the CEO got a phishing email, right? Because this is happening all the time, right? We have email defense systems. But a tool like, Crowd, well, like ContraForce can see that issue coming in from the email security. And it may be that within seconds, there's also a request down in finance for some payment to go out, like you were talking about, Craig, right? And it may be that at the exact same time, there's a, a port that's been trans transitioned on a network switch to a state that it wasn't in before, right? And it may be that any one of those three events happening at one time isn't the biggest deal, but when you start seeing three of those events, four of those events, five of those events happening at the same time, now we need to really alert people. We may have a threat actor inside the corporation, right, inside the environment. We got to deal with it right away and get people to know what's happening in multiple places at the same time. But before a person can even look at it, and this is the next level that it's already doing, 
I can say, well, when that happens, I want to kick off an automation. I want to shut down that network switch. I want to quarantine the CEO's email right now. And I want to maybe shut down our internet pipe in that office until we can figure out what's going on, right? Whatever it is that you want to tell the system is the best course of action if we have a multi-pronged event threat like that. It will follow that and it'll execute it immediately without humans having to get involved and do any of the work. And then alert them immediately that it's been done. And then they can start to make better business decisions based on it. But if we don't do this, we're not going to be able to keep up with the pace of cybersecurity threat actors. Because, the, I mean, there was a news, I think a 2021 report that I read from IBM and the Poneman study talking about the attackers are getting us six times faster than we were able to respond using their automation. <laughs> great, great read if, if, if you all take a minute to look at it. So I'm going to get to Aiden in a minute. Um, we are going to talk in a minute about a law firm that we worked with and, and how we entered a new industry and, and, and how effective that was. But before I do, I mentioned a couple other real world applications. How is this being used in practice? Um, have, anybody familiar with Focus Brands? They own like Schlotsky's Deli, and I think they also own uh, Jamba Juice and a couple of other, you know, they're, they're quick serve food, right? That's their thing. And they have many different brands. All their big challenge was that they had old help desk systems like Eater Remedy at the, at the corporate level, but that didn't work well for them because every single one of those brands has their own identity, their own culture, their own Spanglish, if you will, and the way that their customers want to interact and talk to them. They needed a way of not just improving customer service satisfaction at their level, at the customer level, but then bubbling that up in standard ways to the franchisee owners and then eventually to corporate if those things needed to be, I think you mentioned before, right? How do you standardize that stuff and bring it to, to the corporate level? They implemented ServiceNow very, very successfully to do this. Um, they put it in across multiple brands. Now it's everywhere. <laughs> They're handling over 8,000 tickets a month through the system. They're doing the things that I talked about before. They're, they're able to multi-prong, say, okay, they had an issue with a customer service problem in one particular store, one franchisee. They're able to alert the internal general manager of the store, alert the franchisee owner that there might have been some issue, take the weekly or monthly statistics and bubble those up at the corporate level so that people have clear visibility at the management level into what's happening in each one of these brands. And they weren't able to do that, right, with a regular help desk system. It's the AI and the machine learning that's going on in the middle that's able to really give bespoke custom treatment to each one of the brands so that the customer service experience is going up. Um, MoveWorks, and we talked about them a little bit, they're doing a, a big, big project with Wellstar Health System. Um, Wellstar's a primary care facility, like, like, like our Baylor Scott and White here in Texas, right? That kind of thing. And again, they're seeing tremendous benefits from in implementing this kind of conversational AI. But some things that might not occur to you, um, for example, it isn't just about getting, I mean, it's gotten the lingo down for the, I'll say the patient-doctor relationship. So it can talk about prescriptions. It can talk about medical conditions, which is like a whole language in and of itself, right? That's its own Spanglish. It can talk about all of those things really, really well. So the customer service ratings are going up from it. But more importantly, it can do things for the internal administrative staff of the hospital. Um, for example, patient comes in and they have an issue that may be a HIPAA compliance issue, but they're not sure. Can I give out this information? Right? They can ask a question in Microsoft Teams, because it integrates with Microsoft Teams, that goes to the MoveWorks conversational AI that quickly reads the entire HIPAA policy and the hospital's policies, and then arms the administrative person with all the information they need to know to make a good decision to be able to get back to that, that person right away with what they need. Or maybe there's a form that they need to have them fill out. And so they're just seeing tremendous results from this kind of thing. One thing yep. that I noticed that it's even bad, um, is that it does not cash the, rate, the document that it read, like say for example in your case, in the HIPAA example that you stated, suppose another person online was to ask similar question, 
if you reread the hippa versus just saying that let me just reuse whatever is in the memory can yeah i mean I, it depends on how it's built right. i've seen a couple things where it's using some caching and i've seen right. things where it isn't but is certainly learning each time that it interacts. So for example, if, if a particular question was asked to the system and it, the end result ended up being that the administrator decided to pull down a, per, a particular form from SharePoint, let's say, right, and use that, the next time it's gonna tell the next person with a similar question, this is close enough to something that already happened and it's gonna offer the form. Oh. Do you want this form? Instead of, they said, you know, can you get me a form, right? It's, it's, it's improving all the time. So. That's what we're seeing. And that, of course, is enabling incredibly fast decision support for the humans that have to give the customer right. service on the other end, but also internally. You know, just, just on a simple issue of going to a meeting and I need to know, do I have to have this with me? These tools are enabling people to communicate internally, not just on the external, the customers and, and, and consumers of the business. Um, bon Schoenigan King is a law firm in Syracuse, New York. When we met them, it was actually at like a, a conference kind of thing like this. And we had never worked in the legal industry. Aiden, when we first got started, was, I mentioned to you, I was at a private equity firm. We worked with investment firms and uh, some mixed asset class firms, real estate investors, all that kind of stuff. But we hadn't yet worked with anybody in legal. And the CIO saw what we were doing. His name is Joe Fusick. And he said to me, I really think this technology is great. Call me after I want to talk about it. And we started having meetings with them. And we were extremely honest with him that we don't have any legal software in the system so far, right? So we don't know all the nuances of what you're gonna need. It may take longer. You, you may not get the results that, that we were able to get at my firm or that our investor companies are able to get as quickly. But he had a vision for doing this. He was a pioneer and he had a plan. And he went and talked to the people in senior leadership and he went and talked to his team about the fact that he wanted to do it and ended up bringing us in. And we got some pretty tremendous results. <laughs> in less than three months, they saw a 30% reduction in vulnerabilities, which again, not 97%, but what would you pay, so to speak, for a 30% reduction in vulnerabilities in three, in three months, right? Um, we were able to assimilate all the software. We were able to do it so well that he was able to displace a couple of existing vendors, one that was an MSP doing a bunch of the work on, on some of the systems and, and their computers and helping their internal IT team. But he was also to get able to get rid of a software, I think it was ConnectWise or it might have been Kaseya, I don't really even remember now, it's like a year ago. But it was one of the traditional RMM tools on the market that you know are known for doing remote monitoring and management. And he was able to get this all done in three months. So, Again, it's not because we have smarter people at Aiden, not saying we don't, we have a great team at Aiden, but it's because of the technology, its ability to learn and adapt so quickly, to assimilate new software quickly, and then to get iteratively better and better really, really fast. They also were able to reduce the time that it takes to build new machines. Their new computers they give out to their lawyers and new associates when they start in the firm, they told us by over 75%. There's a case study about this on our website. And so, you know, again, I was a little nervous, quite frankly, to take on a law firm, and especially a big one, they're an AMLAW 200 right away, but it worked. And now we have something like nine or 10 law firms that have signed up since then. Um, and so we're, we're doing well in the legal industry. But it, you know, some of the other big outcomes, he was able to give reports to senior management. He said to us, I was never able to go to, to the senior partners in the firm when they would ask me, how are we doing on patching computers and things like that, and show them even a report that made any sense to them. And we gave them some clear reports that show exactly what's been done and what's going to be done in the future, because it has predictive capabilities, right? Not just what's been done, but what are the known vulnerabilities or viruses or things like that out there? What are we patching next week when we run? Um, he was also able to show them that they're in compliance with their industry client, with their own customers and their industries. And this is particularly important right now. Um, I'm, I'm not only important in finance, which we see all the time, SEC compliance and FINRA and things like that, but HIPAA regulations and other regulations that are more national, like NIST standards, CIS benchmark controls in Europe, the NIS2, uh, which is coming out with all new things and new standards. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this news, but the NIS2 
will go in, I think it's being ratified, it'll go into effect in October of this year. It has a whole new set of standards, and just like we have in this country, the CMMC and NIST and other things, but European companies are gonna be held accountable by NIST too, and they're saying they're gonna give them something like a year to 18 months, and then they're gonna start levying fines for people that haven't caught up and done these kinds of things. And the fines could be as much as one and a half to two percent of the company's revenue. Th think about that. I mean, to a big company, that's a yeah, that's a massive, massive, massive thing that they have to comply with. And in the legal industry, it's it's a huge point of conversation right now. How many of you saw the news about Oric Harrington? They're a big law firm in California. I don't know, anybody see that? About a week ago, or maybe two weeks ago now, there was an article that. They were breached in March, and they didn't fully disclose, they disclosed the breach, but they didn't fully disclose the extent of the breach. And about two weeks ago, it came out that they are responsible for leaking over 600,000 patient records. They're not the hospital, <laughs> right? They're the law firm that had their customers' data across multiple healthcare facilities. So, the law firm needs to be held to the same regulatory standards as their customers. And this is a massive issue hitting across, and that's gonna be the same in accounting, right? Your CPAs, your accounting firms, even your consulting companies that may have your data, the Deloitte and Touches of the world, and, and Accenture's, and everybody else, right? So th this is a massive thing that has to be dealt with, and. AI and hyper-automation are the technologies that are going to get us the, the equipped to be able to deal with these challenges in the next couple of years. Some of the challenges, though, with putting the stuff in, it's not, it's not so easy. <laughs> You've got integration problems. Remember we talked about ServiceNow and all the different systems that it has to talk to and pull data from? Or CrowdStrike, right, where it's got to plug into a whole bunch of downstream cybersecurity tools that are already in place. You got to get those integrations done in order to make it work. Data privacy and security is a huge issue. And, and by the way, um, our CISO is here with us today in the audience, Cindy, and she just hit me the other day. We're all looking at using the new Copilot features in Microsoft and using more ChatGPT ourselves, right? In our, in our, if you're if you're using these technologies and you're not reading the underlying agreements, do you know what may be happening with your data? I can tell you that if it's a free or a trial system that you're getting, there's a very high probability that your data is in the public domain and can be used to train their future models, which means it may show your data may show up in someone else's answer, essentially, right? So you need to read a lot of legal contracts <laughs> to find out what is going on with the data that we're using in the system. That's another big challenge. Um, skill gaps. We have to train ourselves and our teams in these technologies. This is all new, and a lot of people haven't really put a lot of hands on it yet. Um, certainly, there's a big population growing out there, but and that's one of the things I love about ABTP in this organization is the money that, that Toby talked about, to be able to give young people the opportunity to get education, to get certifications, not just college educations, and, and do these things. There's so much learning that has to go on for, for us to level up our players on the field. So we've been talking a lot about Microsoft. Yep. But there's a lot of legacy <laughs> systems out there. Uh, Unix, Linux. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Unidata. <laughs> yep. You know. Oh, Sally, you're dating yourself. I know. Well, and that's the other thing, right? And I actually, you know, that's a great point, Sally. I don't have that in here. But when we talk about integration, that's where I would put that, right? Can we even integrate with some of these legacy systems? Like if someone's got an old AS400 or a VAX, and believe me, I know that sounds crazy. I have seen organizations that are running them. Exactly, and, and some 3270 mainframe, right? Right. Right. So how can we create a data lake to even get that data into one of these modern systems so we can work with it and analyze it? Right. That, Yes, and that's why these projects are not simple, right? They say yes. There's a lot of a lot of work. It isn't a magic bullet. It isn't like you know, hey, I signed the license agreement for Microsoft Copilot. Now I'm in AI and hyper automation. Everything's going to be just fine. It's 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 not definitely not that easy. 
The big one, though, to me, is employee resistance. I, I can tell you that you will encounter this. <laughs> it happens every day. It's in all the conversations that we have. And maintaining these systems, right? So not only are they sometimes resistant, but now you're telling them, I need you to adopt it. I need you to maintain it. I need you to get skilled up on it, right? How many people remember this guy? <laughs> they feel like they're in the interrogation seat, like they're Neo, and somebody is coming in and talking about this, right? That the computer is going to replace their job and wipe them off the face of the earth. They're worried about this or the Terminator. Who remembers the Terminator, right? Well, you've also got the futurists that are dying to get into it and bring it in and, and modernize. Yes. But you've got risk and compliance and yeah. federal regulation. Right. So saying no. So how do we deal with this? And, and government regulation that can't keep up with the pace of technology. Who 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 has an idea about how we how do we get around this emotion? How how have any of you successfully gotten around this emotion? Anyone? I think communication with the cops are important. You know, the executive engagement has to be um, involved in the board buy in, so executive team all buy in. And then there has to be policy, good policy where you know, the employees understand and can sign and buy in. Yes. Additionally, there's training to you know, make them a part of the solution. You guys can do my next slide for me. This is great. Keep going. I think you want to demonstrate to them that your intent is to help them free up their time to allow them to make more value-added decisions and actions for the company and not be weighed down with mundane, day-to-day, -day boring things that could be automated. Yes. It's about stakeholder engagement, right? The communication that you talked about. Not just down to your employees, but up in the organization. You need to get buy-in from people like well, HR. It's also <laughs> got to break through that middle barrier where communication comes down and stuff comes up, but it doesn't yes. get through the mushy zone. In the you need alignment across the entire company because you need your HR to say yes when you go to them for skill training, right, in these kinds of things. Well, somebody has to experience change. Job changes. Right. So you need you need this at the highest level, right? I mean, you really need this from the executive leadership team, the CEO, all the way down to the line workers in IT and IT security that have eyes on glass and things like that. Two things I would argue with this, right? It's yep. not just data because there's people who don't have so much information. Okay. And the other thing about this, which is, is I see stakeholder engagement, but what I don't see in here is organization change management that has to be. Yeah, I mean, I think that's embedded in here, right? When we when we talk about continuous monitoring and adaptation, right? We're talking about monitoring what's happening as it's going on and adapting to it and having the change management control policies throughout the organization to adapt to it at the same time. But but you also have to have a way of knowing what's happening. That's why OCM is such an important piece of that. Yes. And to build off what he's saying, I worked on more than one project and I'm working on one now, where it's a top secret project that involves process change in moving manufacturing from location A to location B. But you can't tell anybody, you can't leverage all the tribal knowledge because there's no incentive program to retain them, there's no change management program to get them to buy into what you're doing. And so, but they're willing to sign up for the failure they're going to experience because they're not willing to implement a change management. Well, I mean, this, this kind of plays into a, a friend of mine. Uh, companies are lunging into these things without thinking this all through. And a friend of mine, a good friend of mine in New York, who runs an application development company that does a lot of AI development now, because I think who is running an application development company that isn't saying they're doing something <laughs> with AI development these days. He was interviewed on a podcast a couple weeks ago, and I, I, it popped up on my Facebook feed. I watched it. And I, I really had a hard time with what he was saying. He, he, was, he was interviewed by a, a company about entrepreneurship, and he was talking about it. And he said, I'm telling all of our customers, he said, well, what about strategy and how do you do this? And he said, oh, you don't need a strategy. I tell all my customers FAFO. Does anybody know what FAFO is? No, F -A, that's F-I-F-O. F-A-F-O. F around and find out. <laughs> now, that, 
that works great. That works great if you're in the business of selling consulting software development and you want to get people to move faster. Right? I understand why he wants to say that. And he said strategy comes later. I, I, don't, I don't agree. I don't agree. I think that if you start that way in most businesses, I'm not saying it can't work. There are examples out there. Like I don't know how many people know the story of Autodesk. There were a bunch of engineers who essentially faffoed and created something and it became a huge product called AutoCAD and Revit and all that. And they're a very successful company. At least that's their story. Right? I'm not saying it can't work. But for every one of those, there's you know, 100 that did something like that and failed. Right? In our, in our big organizations in the world, and even our medium-sized organizations, and, and even small companies, we, we got to have some kind of plan, which starts with the executive communication. It starts with making sure we have buy-in from leadership. Clear objectives and a roadmap. Joe Fasik at that law firm, he knew what he wanted to accomplish. He knew he wasn't happy with the reports he could give his manager. He talked about it all the time. He knew exactly what he needed. He had a MSP that wasn't giving him a good feeling and his users were upset and his own internal IT staff were upset with their performance. And he, and he wasn't able to get done what he needed to get done. He knew it. So he had those objectives and then he saw us and built a roadmap about what they were going to do to transition the systems over those three months. This, uh, coming from the staffing industry, this makes me think entirely of the great resignation. One of the issues being return to office strategy. We're just going back into the office and these massive companies just had resignation after resignation because everybody got used to working remotely rather yes. than an actual strategy of this is how we're going to slowly build back into the office. And, and what happens to their jobs, right? And, and Joe, in his case, he knew he was nearing retirement and in his current role. He had actually joined our company as a business consultant now, but you know he's, he's, he doesn't want a full-time role. Um, and he armed the guy underneath him who was running IT, his director of IT, a guy named Jim, with the skills, the training, got him to work with us. Jim was pretty resistant when we first met him. I think he felt like the guy in the chair. <laughs> um, you know, But he really talked to him and got him to buy in. And then once he had his buy in, he got him through the whole thing. We got through it. A few months ago, Jim was just promoted to CIO of the firm. So clearly, not only did Jim embrace it, Jim got the project done, Jim communicated the results of the project, did the continuous monitoring thing, did the risk management thing, because they knew there could be some issues, right? Maybe they would have challenges with some software, and what was the plan in place if they deployed a machine that didn't work right away? Right? What was the backup plan? Um, all those things. And, that, and that's what made him successful, and that's what got him the promotion, ultimately. We have never seen in our customers, and I've been doing this now, I was a customer for two years and now, and now I'm in the company three and a half years, almost four years. We have never seen one person at one of our customers let go, fired, or even demoted. We've only seen them repurposed, <laughs> elevated. In my own private equity firm, the two guys who were doing this kind of work with Landesk, uh, actually a, a man and a woman, and the woman is now in cybersecurity. She got trained up on the cybersecurity side, and she's one of the lead people there in cybersecurity. And the gentleman, he is running the portfolio company CTO and CISO conferences, in addition to doing a bunch of other strategic things in the company, right? So they got tremendous career elevation in the first six months of, of doing this kind of work, bringing the vendor. So, if it's messaged right, if the stakeholder engagement's there, if you have ways of monitoring the outcomes of the things that you're planning to do, so you can course correct along the way, and you've got your pieces about, you've read your contracts, your data governance, you know where everything's gonna be, that's how you can get a really successful outcome putting in these technologies, and you can go really, really, really fast. See results within a couple of months. I wanna talk for a minute about some of the future trends for this technology. Where, what are we going to use it for in the future and where are we going? Right? The first one, predictive security. So we're already doing some predictive stuff and it's great. I'm sure you've all heard of threat hunting. Right? As people are familiar with threat hunting and threat hunting programs, there's going to be a lot more of that done by the AI. And being able to figure out where might a vulnerability in a system be exploited in the future. Not necessarily the specific vulnerability, but what part of the system might they even go after? And then look for the patterns that somebody's trying to hit it. 
there's a lot more predictive work that's going to come out of the AI solutions and security in the future. Autonomous response, this whole notion of, you know, I get something and then I've got to deal with it right away. Every day, a little bit more of the human side of the response is being handled by the machine. Faster and faster and faster. And that's elevating customer satisfaction in a lot of organizations or even employee satisfaction, what we call the digital employee experience because they're getting what they need right away. Um, somebody was telling me the other day they're using Copilot and they were in a meeting, they didn't even know the Copilot was on and at the end of the meeting, it just dropped the entire meeting minutes of the meeting and said, you know, here's everything you talked about, here's all the action items, here's who you need to follow up with, here's what you gotta do next. Unbelievable, Craig is shaking his head. You've seen it, right? We use it. Right, so doing all that after the meeting would have taken the person, you know, I don't know, a couple of hours to think about it and write all those emails. The machine can spit out all of that work right away and then you just do a couple quick edits and send it all out. So, Productivity. So I, I give a real world, real patience check. Right? Using Course AI in yep. our organization, we have about uh, 480 analysts that are taking jobs throughout the day every day. We have saved $2.7 million every quarter by making these in time saving demands, recreating these things. Yeah. In Aiden, we see 95% of the engineering time that people were spending either pushing an application to a computer or building a new computer, which happens all the time, or decommissioning a computer because somebody's leaving, offboarding, just gone. Just gone. Those engineering hours are gone, and the efficacy is so much greater. Um, AI-driven compliance. We talked about the ability to, to read these things. One of the projects we're working on at Aiden right now, we're calling Ask Aiden. It's pretty new, and we haven't put it out yet. But think about a domain-specific thing. For any industry, what we're doing is we're taking all the stuff related to software deployment and all the policies that are out there. NIST, CIS benchmarks, and NIS2 in Europe, all that. And then creating an LLM where you can ask it questions because people don't even know what they want sometimes. Well, tell me what I should do with this piece of software. What should be our standards if we want to be in compliance with this framework, right? But then the next level of that is probably we don't even need the, the person to ask. It will just automatically sense the environment and recommend based on what are the regulatory issues and the compliance in an industry? What needs to happen? And maybe even automate doing the thing that needs to happen. How do we gather evidence for the auditors that we yeah. That would be also awesome. right. Cybersecurity liability insurance companies, right? Uh -huh. They want to know now to issue, they won't even issue you a policy unless you can prove that some of these things are happening and, and happening really well and that you've got, just having the data to show them right away. It was a giant investigation for IT, right? I, I remember when, when our cybersecurity liability insurance company came in at my private equity firm. We spent a month gathering data to show them what we were doing before we had this, right? After we had this, you can ask, what, what day would you like to see the data from? <laughs> right? what, what hour would you like to see the data from? This is the state of every single machine in the environment at that point, every binary on every machine at that point. And then you can see over time, and not only that, I can now show you predictively what are we going to patch next week, right, before it happens. Threat detection. Um, we talked about this somewhat already, but it's getting more and more and more advanced to where our autonomous systems are going to be battling the bad actors, right, and really, really looking at, at, at them before they get in, looking at them as threat hunting. Decentralized AI operations. This is another big issue that's coming out of the boom. Resiliency. Remember when we had data centers? Now we just kind of trust Microsoft or Google or Amazon, AWS. But remember when we had data centers, we had to worry about this? Well, if AI is going to be the thing that is so important to our businesses, can we risk that the AI is all sitting in one place? We can't, right? That, that hasn't really started yet. Very few people are worried about this problem yet. But this is what's coming. If I have an agent that's such a good AI, do I have multiple copies of it in places and resiliency so if one gets shut down, I can pick up somewhere else. But yeah. if you couple that with any of those three service providers that you mentioned, then you're covered, right? I mean, you have to pay a little more, but... No, you're not. 
No. No. <laughs> you're, 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 I'm talking about your office, right? Do you have, I'm not saying for everything, right? Cer no. Certainly there are, there are parts of it where if you're using a, an outsourced cloud provider, a CSP of you know, one of the big three or someone else, yes, then your, your individual workstations and in, in offices may all have the ability to continue to receive that stuff and they're thinking about this. I'm talking about the solutions that people are creating, right? Think about like the, we call it the citizen developer or whatever, but people are taking things like Copilot or uh, chat GPT and building a local AI solution for themselves. But now that's only running in one place, right? And if it's something we're relying on to feed the CEO the data that he needs, we better have it in more than one place. Yeah. It, it, There are ways to deal with it. I'm not saying there aren't. I'm saying this is a big thing. And also, there are people that are so worried about the data governance and compliance and the large language models using their data to train their, their models, they're building it in private cloud. Like my friend who I told you about in DataBank, right? There's a reason their business is exploding. People are shying away from the big three because of some of the regulatory and compliance issues as well as the data governance issues, and they're choosing to build it in their own sandbox. Well, now you got to worry about the redundancy. Those guys can give it to you. They can give you multiple data centers around the country and distributed servers and all that. But again, it's something you got to worry about. Quantum computing. How many of you are aware that about a week ago, the rumors are, and nobody knows for sure, that quantum computers defeated AES 128 bit encryption? Did you read that? Yeah, OK. 256, which is what most of our big cybersecurity systems are using, particularly in identity and access management and all these other things, to obfuscate passwords and all this other stuff, that's using AES-256. They think it's right around the corner. I mean, how fast this is moving, right? So now, we need quantum computing to write encryption algorithms that are impenetrable by other quantum computers. We're no longer in the realm of standard computing and AES encryption. And we're going to be there within a year, for sure. It's almost inevitable, uh, as, as the guy in the chair said, it is inevitable. <laughs> These are big, big problems that well, we have to deal with. That is correct. That is correct. I mean, look, the, the gains to me so clearly outweigh these challenges. These are things we're going to be dealing with as a society and as IT professionals, right? We have to do all the things we talked about. Um, but a simple gain, remember the example that I gave you guys before? I think it was the Focus Brands example. They were talking about 60% of their manual help desk tickets, and I think this is pretty common. A lot of you that work in IT can probably resonate with this, were just password resets. Right? I mean, it's like, you know, I've been doing IT for 30 years myself, and it's just amazing to me how many times we deal with password resets. I was trying to get my, my airline application with Delta Airlines fixed a couple weeks ago and the, through a chatbot, and the experience was excruciating, excruciating to get my password changed. And the regular password reset where it emails you the link wasn't working. They had to reset something on the back end in my account, right? That reset on the back end is happening by things like ServiceNow and MoveWorks, right? So in the case of Focus Brands, I remember reading, they were able to get that down to 10% this year. 10% of all their 8,000 a month help desk tickets are now being handled by an operator to help and assist the user with the manual password reset. Right, so think about all that effectively unproductive time, right, for somebody to walk somebody through how to reset their password or switch a trigger on the back end to reset their account. That's all being handled with hyper-automation. The system talks to them about it, understands the problem, 
goes and makes whatever changes have to be made on the back end or fixes it or sends them new information, gives them the instructions, walks them through the process. Walks them through the process with the lingo that they use in their Spanglish, right? So that they can get their password reset and get on with their day and doing whatever they need to do. That's getting better and better. If it was 10% this year, it's gonna be 2% next year, right? Um, what do you all have to do, <laughs> right? after this meeting, after this discussion? Well, you have to think about your role differently, I think, going forward. I would humbly submit to you. We, we have to be ambassadors of change. We have to be strategic visionaries as IT people, right? We have to be bringing these concepts to our organizations, socializing them and talking about them. We've gotta be risk managers, right? We have to figure out what are all the implications on downstream systems, data governance and privacy, all of these kinds of things. We have to read contracts because we better understand what we're signing up for when we sign up for it, not just lunge in and say, yeah, yeah, read, that means the small print, exactly. But, but, but I was about to say, we have a tool for that too, right? I have taken contracts and dumped them into ChatGPT and asked it to pull me to the relevant sections because I don't want to read an 80 page agreement Bring me to the five paragraphs I need to look at. And it will do it. And put that in public yes. And again, I wouldn't. ChatGPT will say at the bottom when you do it, the disclaimer is please don't accept legal advice from ChatGPT, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Right. But, and, and, and no, you should, you should heed that warning, right? Because it does make mistakes. And it may miss a section you need to see. So I wouldn't completely rely on it. It can help you, but you still got to do your own skim job. Yeah, and, and I mean, I'll give you a simple example. I was, I was trying to solve a problem for my daughter, a school problem, and it was about multiplying fractions because I never did Singapore math. I was good in math, but she's learning Singapore math. And I put it in, and, it, and I don't remember the exact equation, but it came out with like one-eighth, and I looked at it, I'm like, that doesn't seem right, and I did the math my way, and I came up with a quarter, and I, I couldn't, I saved the conversation. I couldn't believe it. I typed in, how did you get this wrong? Here's my math and how I got to one quarter and said, you're absolutely right, I'm very sorry, sometimes we're not 100% perfect, let me redo it in Singapore math, I missed one thing, here's the answer. I couldn't believe it, I actually never saw that in ChatGPT until about a week ago. I beat, I beat ChatGPT on something. But now it's smarter next time somebody asks. Yes, yes, but you. this is why you have to be careful, you can't take this as 100% guaranteed, right? Um, change agents. We talked about, Craig talked about change management policies. There's the policy side, but being an agent of change to me is a lot more than the policy side. It's having this conversation with your teams and people back at your workplaces. Now, somebody need to clarify that. I'm not talking about technical change management, right? I'm not talking about policies and processes. I'm talking about the Buying it, Correct. Their and having the empathy that goes on with the people when things change around them. Those are the big pieces that make a break of project. And those are the big pieces of being a change agent. That's right. You have to be able to connect with people, show empathy, but show them a path forward. Right? There's a there's a, a great line I heard a long time ago. Everybody says they want change until it hits their until it hits their world and then they don't want change. Yeah, right? That's just a natural human change condition. Without disruption is what everybody wants. Yeah. And they can't have that. Yeah. They, don't, they want change, but they don't want to disrupt one single thing that they've been doing. <laughs> right? We have to be change agents in IT for the whole organization because this is coming at the organization and we are the conduit. Talent developers. We talked about this, right? We, organizations like this one, but in our own organizations, go get, go get HR's attention, go get the professional development resources you need to give your employees, your staff, and your peers the opportunities to go learn about this stuff and go to more things. And lastly, ethics guardians, right? We're, I'm sure many of you are hearing about ethical AI. There's so many quandaries wrapped up in this. <laughs> um, who remembers the story? I think Microsoft was quite embarrassed, actually when ChatGPT first came out, I remember it was within the first week or two, 
it, somebody in the New York Times published an article about a conversation and they posted the whole conversation that they had had. Does anybody remember that conversation? It was about essentially the person was asking questions and as it went, it, it started to go dark. And it tried to convince this, it was a man, tried to convince him that he should potentially leave his wife and, and divorce her and move on and do something about the kids. It was a crazy article, right? And then Microsoft came out with a rebuttal to that saying, you know, well, we understand it's new technology, so we're going to put a guardrail on it. You're not allowed to ask it more than six questions now. That was, I remember the, the response. And of course, since then, it's been fixed and lifted and the new models have accounted for that. But when we're adopting these things fast, we really need to look at what are the potential risks and outcomes and ethical quandaries that can come out of putting these things in. Right? How can they be potentially hurtful and how do we guard against them? Well, and also we've got to go back to the definition of right and wrong. Well, yeah. that is culture can be that's cultural. True. And and I also want to point out that all of those things are not exclusive to IT and IT security. Those are requirements for the whole business. Right. You can't just delegate you know ethical guardrails to the Correct. risk committee right like you you have to you that's why the organizational change management is so important because you have to have buy-in from everyone to be successful so yeah. so i'm going to leave you guys something to go and, and go and search for and get in our risk so who all knows who jeff Ed was godfather of ai it is, he is the founder of Bard and worked for Google for years. Um, and he did an interview on 60 Minutes and got the YouTube and go search for it. And he talks about what he promotes in his is about right now, which is the dangers of generative AI. Um, highly encourage you to go look at that. You want to understand the risks that are out there and the guardrails that they're going to get from the risk that haven't been done. Yep. There's a lot of people talking about it. I, I, I saw another senior leader from Google talking about something very similar just the other day. It wasn't Jeff Hedden, it was someone else, I don't remember. It, it's, it's a big conversation. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I'm not a, a doomsday kind of person, right? I'm a very optimistic person. I think this is going to help us do better, just like the internet helped us get information faster, right? <laughs> right, right. But, but, but there are people out there, of course, who are talking about, you know, effectively, we've left the genie out of the bottle. And now we're going to get to the point where Skynet becomes aware, and you know it's it's very damaging, and we can't. And, right. Well, we can't talk about the disparities across. Uh, you know, we put guardrails in the Western civilization, but there's whole countries and nation states that are dealing with the West. Yeah. I'll get, they don't have those guardrails. I'll, I'll give you one other thing that was said that I thought was brilliant. I don't remember who said it now, but the Turing test that we talked about, which is a test that you know. If, if an AI is talking to it, if it, no one, nothing's ever passed the Turing test, right? And the test is, can can you tell you're you're not talking to a human, right? And if if you can't, then you pass the Turing test. And somebody said the other day, well, if the AI is smart enough to pass the test, it's smart enough not to let you know that it can. Going back to 1980s, the manufacturing automation, yeah. 2000 was all IT automation. Uh, yeah. You know, getting out of everybody was concerned about that. Uh, yes. The same approach. That is about the thing is, that. if you dig in and you really understand how any of this technology is working, even ChatGPT, there is no, not we're not even close to what you would call sentient, right, or or cognitive thinking. But we won't know. That's why it made that. That's why it made that mistake. All it's doing is, it, again, I want to get into the whole technology and the vectors and how it works, but but the, all it's doing is essentially a set of comparisons, right? It's essentially saying, you know, are there enough instances when I research across a broad swath of data that it's pattern recognition, right? That that's what's happening all the time, and then I can, re, you know, regurgitate from there. It's regurgitation of some pattern that it's recognizing. It's not. It looks like it's talking to you. <laughs> but that's not, in fact, what it's doing. It's not working the same way as the human mind. To your point, right, you talked about the Turing test, right? You know, it was already predicted that in 2029 that AI will surpass human intelligence. 
and I think he's lifting 95% on everything he has predicted so, so far. He's 95% everything predicted, and he's saying AI will surpass human interaction by 2029. Yeah, what yeah. what does he say is the ramifications of that? So, he has, he has a book out there called Singularity is Near. I'm, I'm just kind of reading an excerpt that was in there. And, and first, that by 2029, AI will surpass human intelligence and master the Turing test. And second, by 2045, humans will merge with AI they created. In phenomenon, he terms... He terms as the singularity. He's selling books, right? Yeah. But <laughs> I just, I just want to, like, so, yeah, I'm not saying he's wrong. I have no idea if he's right or wrong. But I went to an optometrist about two weeks ago because I'm not particularly happy with these glasses. And, and he, he did another, uh, sorry, an ophthalmologist. I had been to an optometrist to get the glasses. And he says, well, the problem here is your prescription is, is too strong. And, you don't, you don't, and he's like, where'd you get these glasses? And I told him, the famous doctor in, in the legacy in the do, in Dallas area here. And he said, well, and he told you you needed all that, right? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, well, he's in the business of selling glasses. <laughs> I'm a doctor in the business of trying to take care of people and give them great advice. But that's why he discredits it. Yours has to be superior to something he's like aligning with that. Like what they're doing to it. Ethics. That we've been talking about and moral responsibility, right? And if we are careful as a society, not that we're particularly great at that these days, but if we're careful as a society, I believe that we'll, we'll be able to harness the technology and the power of technology. Smart people will figure out what to do about it. We already are. Sorry. We, we already are, right? The number one takeaway that's in there is this is game changing, right? Game changing. And you know, we have to embrace it. We have to be educating ourselves, educating our teams, talking to our stakeholders up and down in the organization, and making sure we have the alignment that we need to put it in responsibly. We can't put our heads in the sand. We become irrelevant if we put our heads in the sand. Okay? And with that, I would just say, open up the floor to Q&A. Happy to take any more questions. Anybody have any questions that we didn't cover? I may not know the answer, but I'm happy to try. Well, one thing that's curious to me, and thank you very much for bringing up in this formative talk. Uh, I didn't really have a good grasp of the overall concept of high-level automation in the context of AI uh, and machine learning. So this little carbon machine here, version 1.0, has been doing some machine learning. And I see how the high automation can bring a lot of current technologies together, make the process so much more efficient. And, uh, yeah. But now, on the other side, looking at the cyber threat and cyber security, what I don't understand is the world of that world and how they're able to uh, present so many threats to this side of the fence, let's say, this side of the, and even kind of the right side, uh, and how are they going to leverage AI and, and, and hyper information to make things even harder for us to well, Sorry, I can't read that far. What's your name again? It's Kim. Uh, Kim. Kim. Have you ever been uh, on a tour or anything of any one of those cyber companies that are out there, like um, CrowdStrike, Sentinel One, any of those guys? Uh, some of them have some pretty incredible um, simulations and maps that they can show you, where they're they're tracking the number of cyber threats and nation state actors and attacks that are happening across the world in their knocks. I've been inside some of those. It's frankly mind-blowing how many attacks are happening around the world at one time and then when they put it up on a board and effectively it looks like war games right where you've got the whole global map but they're just showing you you know anything that they've picked up it's absolutely incredible so when you ask me how it's because they don't have much else to do they're usually that's their, either their job, meaning they're nation state actors that have been hired with and funded, well funded, with the mission of doing that all day, every day, or they're desperate, right? They're people who are looking for a way to make money somehow, and that's I mean, all the ransomware and things that you're hearing about. They didn't have any other way where they are from to really advance, and they saw this as their ticket to solving, uh, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Well, like so, Nigeria, with, with the 
percenters of GDP is malware for the nation. Yeah. <laughs> That's and, and then the other thing is they're smart, so they're using this stuff too. I was just about to say, so in November of last year, we had Charity Wright here from uh, Reporting Future, right? So she has been working with Social Security Area for everyone on both sides and doing a bunch of things. But one of the things that they, they talk about is, is Reporting Future is seeing and reporting right now the huge jump that's going on in the threat actors using AI to do those two things, and mainly in the social engineering and malware stuff, right? Yep. The social engineering and being able to use your interact. Uh, in fact, I just got a text on my personal phone last week from our CEO who doesn't even have my personal number to say I need to send him something. So, you know, it, it's just amazing when they're using to scrape information across the internet, be able to get it, and then re recreating it and social engineering it in a way that sounds like it's going. And, and they're seeing it all the time. So, what for the future has got millions of dollars in development right now of generating AIs to be able to look for all those items that are being generated. So it's a, it's a cycle that's going on. It's not going to slow down. It's only going to speed up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for your... What's your name? Eddie Royal. Eddie Royal. Nice to meet you. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, this friend that actually works for Hawaii. Uh, and uh, my, my issue is with looking at AI as a... Uh, Overall umbrella for what you're looking at. Uh, Snowden happened to be there and his family did some terrible things. Uh, unfortunately, how do we combat what they How do we combat what gave to China, what gave to Russia, what gave to nation states that this new generative uh, AI or uh, hyper will, hyper automation will help us? look at what he actually gave to other nation states that will come back that information on that level or is that such a or is it too high up to be able to think of it that way? we're effectively in a cyber arms race yeah. right one or the old analogy to me was always who remembers i mean i don't know i don't use one anymore because it doesn't seem like it even does anything but radar detectors Right? The, the, when I was a kid, the, the radar detectors came out, and first you had, I don't know, X band or something, right? And then X K K A. They kept changing it, so the cops would come out with a new detector, and then we all, I mean, a new gun, and then we would all go buy the detector for that gun, right? It, it's kind of the same idea. Like they will come out with a new attack, and then we go and buy the defense for that attack. Or as people who work in cybersecurity say often, it's a gift that keeps on giving. I mean, but it's just, there's no sign that this will slow down in any way, shape, or form. And so, again, we can put our heads in the sand and, and sort of say we're not going to try, or we can say we're going to adopt these new solutions, these new tools, we're going to learn about them, and we're going to get really good at it ourselves and, and, and start defending ourselves. Brad, other questions? I can't fix that. I have no idea. I was ask, are there any efforts to we need an AI to come up here and fix the projector. Do we have yeah, one of those, Craig? Right. Right. So. You've been cut off. You've been cut off by AI. Exactly. Um, are there any efforts on a on a on a, a like a United States level to uh, create like a, a force field, you know, at the government level to control? some of this activity coming in in the internet. I mean. Absolutely. Yeah. I have friends that work in the federal government, and absolutely. We have, uh, you know, effectively the Iron Dome of cybersecurity, right? Right. Or we'd be, we'd be getting crushed right now. Right, right, okay. There's, there's our own nation state defenses. We don't only have our own nation state defense teams. We have our own nation state threat, counterterrorism team, effectively, right? We are launching attacks at nation state actors that are launching attacks at us. The best way to de-risk them is to hit them where they live, so to speak, right? So this is a bi-directional war, cyber war. And it's happening, been happening for years, decade, more than a decade, a couple of decades. 
Our government spends a ton of money. Right. Hey, Josh, a yeah. Quick question. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, on, you know, when you look at like AI chat GPT, how accurate do you say that was in, in today's current state? Because like when I was looking up some information the other day, I work in human resources. Yeah. Some of these attacks, like just some of the attacks and sports act laws, I saw something that wasn't completely accurate. Old information? Yeah, in AI, and I just, I'm just curious how, how... It also depends on the model you're using. So like with ChatGPT, there's the free version, the paid version, the turbo version. There's, and, and, okay, I'm using and, free. Yeah, the free, they've only trained those models up until maybe it was over a year old. Yeah, it was years old. Now it's gotten better. I think the free has gotten better, maybe up to 22. The paid model, it's just a larger model, so it's taken more data. We're, there's another interesting stat that like we're exponentially generating more and more data on the internet every year. So each year, I'd have to look at that up, that up again, but there are stats about that. We're creating so much data that even to feed the model is is more and more difficult, which is why they're charging for the ones that have everything that's that's up to date. But plus they can. Um, and but yes, if you pay for the paid model, it should be getting data that's no more than maybe a month old, but in HR, policies, regulations, laws, state by state, I know all of that stuff changes. Yeah. The new new regs out in New York and California this year are different. Um, I was even just trying to look up uh, yesterday or day before energy electricity consumption rates in the state of Ohio. And I couldn't get current 2024 data very easily. I, got, I was able to finally prompt engineering chat GPT well, and there, there's, there are classes you can take on how to prompt it. Um, I, I do a lot, of, on that I do a lot of FAFO. A lot of figure it out, right? See what works and see what doesn't work. Um, but if you prompt engineer well, you can get to the answers faster. Sometimes you have to tell it, I want you to go research this specific source or website. Yeah. Give it a URL and say, go read that entire website, and it will do it. But you sometimes have to point it, otherwise you don't know where it's going to get that information. You may want to send it to SHRM or the state yeah. you know, that you're trying to get the information about, send it to the state website and ask it to do a lookup. But more or less, I mean, I need to get the paid version. That's what I For sure the paid version will make a big difference. It also makes a difference in the length of the prompt that you can give ChatGPT, so with generative AI. So you can only give it so many characters in the free version. They call them... Uh, Threads or something, whatever. I can't remember. It's not threads. It's like another name if anybody knows. Shout it out. But it's about the vectors it can handle. And so in the paid version, you can give it a much longer prompt. And you can like give it a prompt that's read this entire you know 25-page paper and then do something with it. So in the free version, initially, you can even ask the thing to give you all kinds of responses and information. And yeah. Just kill you with stuff. Then over time, I started reading articles it was getting lazy and it was providing less information. And yeah. Somebody else wrote an article and said their trick to that was to say, I've currently broken all my fingers and I can't type this. Would you please provide this? And then the chat, the chat GPT would give them the full recon. Yeah, you don't even have to say you've broken all your fingers, though. You can just say, I need you to type this entire thing out. Or like a lot of times when you ask it a question, um, it will respond back to you with the full answer, and then if you ask a clarifying question, it'll just give you the piece it's clarifying. But you want the whole thing, so you can cut and paste it into something else. Or you can say, now regurgitate the entire thing and incorporate that piece. You don't have to tell it why. Right. It doesn't care why. <laughs> so it's like the engineering is the whole trick. Yeah. Like it does get upset if you don't say please and thank you, though. <laughs> This is my first time really using Dolly, and it worked extremely well. One thing I don't know if you noticed. Oh, it is up there now. Here, let me show you something. Um, if I, I, I actually turned some of these slides and made them uh, smaller like this and used this, this design tool in PowerPoint, I don't know if you can see the, the letters aren't right. Now, when I first started doing it, I thought, well, maybe this is like it's being creative. <laughs> it's not being creative. The image generating AI is not good yet at incorporating English into a picture. It's making mistakes. 
It looks like it's trying to be artistic, but it's not trying to be artistic. It's making mistakes. It's not, it's, it's not using text. It's fixing. That's, that's correct, and it can't get the letters right. So anyway, I, I did want to put this up just so that if people do want to contact me after the event, uh, please, like I said, reach out. I'm absolutely happy to engage in these kinds of discussions. I like talking about it. I like thinking about it. And I don't even mind worrying about it and what it's going to do in the future. Um, I think it's our obligation, our responsibility to figure that stuff out. And the only way we're going to get there is by conversations like this one. Right? Thank you, everybody.